Hey, hello everybody. This is uh, Al Soto here, and can you believe it? We're in the ninth study guide for the ninth discipline. Actually, the tenth study guide because we did an introductory one on the pillar principle, but we're talking about practicing solitude and gratitude. And boy, am I really, really excited about this. Going through the book, The Spirit Form Life with Pastor Jack Hayford, and we're doing these study guides to kind of uh, really open up our hearts and our minds in a deeper way as we're going through this message series on how we can be rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ in such a way that our whole lives on a daily basis takes on a whole new dynamic. Uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 35 says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he, Jesus, went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Jesus oftentimes would remove himself from the crowds so that he could have, uh, you know, some time with the Father and some time of solitude, um, especially after heavy public ministry we see throughout the New Testament or the Gospel accounts. Principle that is behind this discipline is this. A disciple must wisely learn to develop the habit of regularly experiencing both the private and and personal presence of God in the benefit of individual time away from life's daily demands in, in a place with limited distractions. Without this, life and service becomes a blur, often producing discouragement, diversion, or defeat. And with this, life is regularly being rechanged and recharged with energy and a spiritual dynamic. And that's basically what it means to seek out solitude and silence so dive let's dive right on in you know the, the 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 scripture you know has a lot to say you know the heavens declare the glory of god and the firmament shows his handiwork that whole declaration that in creation we could see the beauty of god and that he's the creator and this last week we talked about the three things that intellectually we have to wrap our heads around in order to really live a life of solitude Think of the word Shabbat or Sabbath. You know, I've oftentimes heard this, that we struggle because the lack of activity for some of us is I'm not getting things done. I'm not uh, succeeding at something or finishing a project. But here's the beauty of Shabbat. The beauty of Shabbat is while I am resting, God is still at work. Parker Palmer, he really, uh, this. I love this quote that he gives and he's talking about Psalm 19.1. Solitude does not necessarily mean living apart from others. Rather, it means never living apart from oneself. If it is not about the absence of other people, it is about being fully present to ourselves, whether or not we are with others. Community does not necessarily mean living face to face with others. Rather, it means never losing the awareness that we are connected to each other. It is not about the presence of other people. It's about being fully open to the reality of relationship, whether or not we are alone. So Parker Popper takes what I call an ontological or a state of being, oneself, that uh, we're not separating. We're looking inward. We're looking at our interior life when we're practicing solitude and silence to see who our true self really is. Um, and so solitude and silence leads us uh, to finding and discovering our true self. Pete Scazzaro, who wrote The Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, says this, there's a definition of silence and solitude that leads to emotional health. And here are the two contexts, he says. Solitude is the practice of being absent from people and things to attend to God. I turn off my cell phone. I, I get away from a TV and all the noise just so that I can focus on God. Silence is the practice of quieting every inner and outer voice, because we all got the committee in our heads trying to talk to us, to attend to God. So I, I love what um, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, or no, it's Henry Nguyen who makes this statement. Without solitude, it is almost impossible to live a spiritual life. In this busy world, with all of us having hectic schedules, the healthiest thing we can do is to practice the discipline of solitude and silence. Solitude gives us a new perspective. 
Uh, and the perspective is this, my life in his. In other words, I'm in Christ. How do I live out this life in Christ? So solitude and silence uh, is a pattern of following Jesus in our daily life. It's the pattern of the death and resurrection of Jesus being practiced in our life. I got to tell you, Robert uh, Weber wrote a really, really incredible book called uh, The Divine Embrace. And he's talking about how we can live every aspect of our life within the divine embrace of God. And he says there are three vows uh, that we need to make. And, um, you know, the word vow comes from the Latin word votum, which is a solemn promise in which a person is bound to an act of service or a condition. And in the early world of spirituality, it meant to voluntarily bind a person to a particular spiritual rule or a prescribed guide for conduct and action. And so in the, in the modern day translation of it, we call it a rule of life. We, we develop a rule of life that says, these are the things that I'm committing myself to that, that, that in my life with Jesus, I'm living at the heartbeat of my master, of Jesus. And living at his heartbeat means that I am making a vow that in this world, I'm going to choose to learn how to live the way of life that Jesus desires me to live. There are several outcomes to this kind of um, life being practiced. Let me give you uh, what uh, Robert Weber says. Robert Weber says the first one is stability. In the monastic concept uh, of stability, it was translated that the spiritual life means to stay in your baptism. This is not the only time I mentioned this. I talked about how Ralph Martin, a New Testament scholar, when we were in living in the power of water baptism, said that we continue to live out our baptism. Uh, Luther had that same concept. Ma matter of fact, we... Uh, the whole notion of Luther became the phrase that we live under water. We identified with the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. We continue in this stability to live out the death and resurrection of Jesus by continually dying to sin and rising in new life of the Spirit, staying in the divine brace of his Father. Can I tell you this? This is a struggle for some of us because some of us came from family systems that uh, discipline was never done out of love, so it was abusive. And as a result, we we kind of see God's loving correction through the filter of punishment. And and you see, God came in to, to flip this upside down kingdom on us that says that we are like that seed that falls that is continually going through uh, death and new life. And God never leaves us out of his embrace. It is not punishment. It's not chastisement. It is the principle of daily doing what needs to be done as Jesus puts to death those things in us. And, and that's, it's powerful. That's, that's, but, but, that, but solitude and silence becomes the context that allows us to come into that kind of stability. Secondly is fidelity. Fidelity is to remain in the vow. The word is derived from the Latin word uh, fides, which it means faith. It is a derivative. It, it is a deriv derived from a person who takes on the foul of fidelity. Is a person you can count on. It means that you trust them, right? This is the place in our solitude that we meditate and we ask some questions. And here's where Robert we Weber lands, and I think it's so right on. Am I faithful to the new life in Christ that I'm living? And can someone count on me to be uh, like this? In other words, am I going to be consistent? Am I going to be a person who's going to have fidelity to this vow of becoming more like Jesus? Within that notion of reflection, we ask questions. Am I going to love with all my heart, mind, and soul, God? Am I there? Where am I at with that, God? And how am I loving my neighbor as myself? You see, the spirit-formed life is not a sentimental way of speaking about God. It's not an escape from all the challenges and the re reality of life that we face in this world. 
No, no, no. It is a strange way of being, thus a very different way of living. We're being, and then we do. It's, it's, it's so counter to the culture around us and the world around us. And, and, and as a result of that, we are living the incarnation of Jesus out in everyday life. Now, I want you to think about the incarnation because we're coming up to that season of Christmas, of God becoming one of us, taking on human flesh. He was 100% God, 100% man. Do you, do you realize that to the religious and political leaders of the day and most people that encountered Jesus, he was completely foreign to the way they were thinking and living. It's the same for us. Jesus resides in us. Jesus is living and, and forming that life in us. And as a result, it is completely foreign to our, our family of origin, the things that we're being freed from, the process and the journey of life into freedom. It's, it's our new life in Christ that's coming to the forefront. It's the, it's, and so to be faithful in this life seeks to live out Jesus in a land that doesn't even understand it. Some people will look at us and say, what do you mean to forgive in that moment, to release in that moment? Because it is foreign to the human mindset. And we are trying to become, as humans, surrendered more to the work of the Spirit in our lives that's, that's working that new life of Jesus in us so that we can be living witnesses and examples to that new life. And then thirdly is obedience. Robert Weber says you cannot escape obedience. Stability in Jesus and fidelity in Jesus are not grounded in self, but are grounded in the obedience to the voice of God. And obedience begins with listening. We're listening for that voice. And humility is required to be obedience. Because it is humility that we live under the, the commandments of Jesus. We're surrendering ourselves. Remember Pastor Michelle, just a few weeks ago, we, and I did that um, video training on submission. Obedience have, is, is involved in listening. And humility is how I live what I hear out in obedience. And so we want to recapture some of the ways that we can engage Christ that's I'm not, not sure that is not intellectual. Because you see, a lot of our approaches is I just got to study the word. And, and Bible study is good, folks. I'm not saying it's wrong. Studying the word is, is, is powerful and necessary. But I want to, I, this last Sunday, I referred to a few things. And I want to give you a few ways that we can engage God that are not just intellectual. Now, I want to say this. Um, there are two approaches to um, engaging Jesus what, or, or the Word. And one is meditation. And meditation is a process in which words and events and all of life are prayerfully pondered. We uh, reflect upon those things. We try to draw conclusions, meaning, even morals and principles from them. And it's, and it's basically an activity which is very intellectual and reasoning, but it's aided by grace, right? It's all aided by grace. There's another way of approaching it, and it's contemplation. Contemplation at its core is resting in God. It's, it's lovingly gazing upon Him. It's knowing beyond knowing or a focused attention on God that's not trying to figure God out as much as just to see the magnificence and to soak in uh, how incredible God is. Contemplation transcends thinking and reasoning and is engaged, and it even engages some feelings and emotions, but it's not just emotional based. It's a practice, practice that is centering oneself and emptying to listen and just to empty and say, I want to ponder, I want to gaze, I don't want to lose sight. It would be the difference between driving down a country road where there's a beautiful scene, but you got a destination you got to go to. So you're looking at your GPS because you don't want to miss the next turn. Thus, you don't get to see the beauty. And all of a sudden, your spouse looks over at you and said, did you see that meadow back there? Did you see that lake? Did you see the eagle that was flying? And you go, I didn't see anything because I was looking on my GPS. See, so rather than look at the GPS and the destination, contemplation says, let me look at the beauty. Let me just take a moment and soak in the beauty of who God is. 
one of the there's two approaches to contemplation that are huge. One of them is Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina is the prayerful reflection and sacred listening of Scripture. And I'm going to tell you one of the easiest ways you could do this. Get into a room, get quiet, take your passage. You can get on uh, uh, Verse is a great one. You can get on a lot of the different programs. Choose your verse and you can click on a voice that will read that passage over and over to you. And while that passage is being read, read you just close your eyes and you listen. You open your heart and you allow the Holy Spirit just to formatively begin to speak to your spirit as you sacredly listen to the scriptures. It's one of my favorite ways of approaching the scriptures. Uh, the other way is Thomas Keating, which is called centering prayer. Uh, centering prayer, as he describes it, is the actual consenting to God's presence and in doing so, letting go of of the present moment with all of its psychological content. So let me explain to you a, a very simple way of what centering prayer is. Uh, I do this, I can lay down on the floor in my room, I could be anywhere, and I just empty myself, try to take all the thoughts and say, I'm going to get all the task lists and all the thoughts and just listen. One of my favorite places of centering prayer uh, was uh, not too long ago, Valerie and I were along the coast and I took 30 minutes just to center and just to listen to the waves, empty myself and focus and just listen. That kind of moments are powerful, just to empty and listen. Let's talk a little bit about gratitude. You know, a leading scientific expert on gratitude, Dr. Robert A. Emmons, defines gratitude as having two parts affirming goodness in one's life and recognizing the sources of it, of it, this goodness lie at least partially outside of ourselves. I would assent to this. Anything good is God and God is good and God is good all the time. Gratitude, I believe, is one of those things we need to exercise that are so important that it has such spiritual power in us Gratitude opens up our eyes to see. I love what Thomas Merton says. One of the most important, most neglected elements in the beginnings of the interior life is the ability to respond to reality, to see the value and the beauty in ordinary things, to come alive to the splendor that is all around us. That's a magnificent way to say stop and smell the roses, right? I mean, I need to hear that. All of us, uh, life becomes cluttered. Can I tell you this? Gratitude frees us from the disease of self-focus. This is the reason why recovery programs like your 12 Steps, AA, Celebrate Recovery, 180, Operation 180, they always tell you, practice gratitude constantly because gratitude gets us off ourselves. Now, you're going to be doing a Bible study on Galatians 1, 9 through 12. You're going to be talking about it in your group. Um, but verse 12 says this, after Paul prays for wisdom and knowledge and uh, concerning God's will and how they can walk in a manner worthy of God, look what he says in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of, of the saints of the light. You know what I love about that? God invites us in to partner with him on kingdom mission. That's what it means. We're qualified. Grace has qualified us. We're not disqualified. Just like a noun or an adjective is modified by a, uh, uh, modifies a noun. It gives more meaning, more color to that noun. So Jesus has already, already qualified us. For what? To share in the inheritance of of the saints of the life. What is the inheritance of the saints of the life? Well, it's not money and stuff, folks. The inheritance is people. It's the lives that we get to touch, the people that we get to engage with. And our gratitude should never, ever, ever miss the importance of what it means to live in that kind of gratitude. So let me give you a quick summary. I know this is a little longer than our normal videos. Solitude requires time, thought, and a certain amount of quietness. Solitude is waiting on God. God, I'm waiting for you. Psalm 27, 14, Psalm 130, 5 through 6, you can look those up. 
Three things constitute the practice of solitude. Prayerful reflection, self-examination, and interaction with God's word. And then I've given you some discussion words, but that's the summary to the study for the chapter that we're just finishing. Man, I am just so excited. And I'm thankful in this season of thankfulness that we get to do this together. What an honor it is to be on this journey together. And I sure hope you're getting so much out of this. And I hope that you post and say, hey, this is what I'm learning. This is what God is teaching me. Can I just pray for you real quick? Jesus, I just thank you, all, each person that's going through this journey of the 10 principles of the spirit form life, the disciplines and practices we want to embrace, that Jesus, you will be with them this day. May we be people who learn how to connect with you consistently. May we be people that learn and to surrender ourselves in obedience. And may we be people that stop to meditate, but not only meditate, but to center ourselves, emptying all of our thoughts to, to intake your beauty, your magnificence, your glory. Lord, on a daily uh, basis with all of the activity, may we learn how to find those moments of engaging with you. Lord, I pray this in your name, in the wonderful, most awesome name of Jesus. Amen. Man, I said it before, I'm going to say it again. I sure love you. And I pray that you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. And know this, you matter to God and you matter to us. God bless you.